Please welcome Tammy Wharton, President and CEO of Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland. Good morning. Hopefully there's enough coffee now, so we're going to try that again. Good morning. good morning. That was really good, so I guess there is. The decaf may be uh, filled up to the brim, but the rest is probably gone. I'd like to send, extend a warm welcome to the community leaders that are here today, board members of Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland, our, my fellow Girl Scout sisters and girl advocates that are here today joining us for this community conversation. I also want to recognize a special group of individuals who have come from all over the country, from South Dakota, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, um, and that's my fellow sister CEOs from different councils from across the country. Can you guys stand up and be recognized? We're so pleased to have you guys here today. So this is Girl, State of the Girl 2020, and we're bound to have a lot of great conversation. We have some incredible speakers today that you're going to hear from, and we're going to look at what are some of the issues that we're dealing with with girls today. Let's take a look at what girls are learning in Girl Scouts today and the leadership skills that they're going to need for the future. at Girl Scouts, we're dreaming big about the careers and futures of all of our girls. And we do that through four program areas. STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Outdoors, Life Skills, and Entrepreneurship. And if you don't know that Girl Scouts has the largest social entrepreneurial program for girls called that little known program, the Girl Scout Cookie Program, and if you haven't gotten your fix of delicious treats, we do have a booth out there. Um, but as you buy the cookies, think about what the girls are learning, because it's even more important about the skills that they're getting from this program. They're learning skills like goal setting, decision making, money management, people skills, which is super important in this day of technology, and of course, business, business ethics. Now, in line with the anniversary of the 19th Amendment's ratification of the women's right to vote, Girl Scouts has a renewed focus in civics. We've just introduced some new civics badges. Our daisies are learning how to be a good neighbor, and our senior and ambassador Girl Scouts are learning about voting and public policy. This is incredibly important today because many schools have dropped their civics educations from the curriculum. And, sadly, only one in four Americans can name all three branches of government. So it becomes even more important for Girl Scouts to help educate girls about what their civic duty is um, with our civics badges. In 2018, Girl Scouts of the USA introduced a new pledge. It was to, it's called the STEM Pledge, and it's to put 2.8, 2.5, I put 0.8 because we're going to put 0.3 ourselves here, into the, STEM, um, into the STEM workforce um, pipeline by 2025. 
we're introducing girls at an early age to the workforce careers in areas like engineering, cybersecurity, computer science, and more through our badge programs. And you saw some of them just in the video um, that we showed. Now, as a little teaser, we're going to share a little bit more about our Dream Big pro, um, transformational initiative later in this program. And that encompasses the two pillars of STEM and the outdoors. And now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce what you guys are here for, to hear from one of our girl members. Lily Cole is a Girl Scout of Ohio's Heartland board member. So she sits in our board meetings and participates. She's not saying, oh, all you guys do is talk about money and policy. She's actually helping to change what's happening in our future at Girl Scouts. The skills she learns in the board meetings, she's applying not only through the Girl Scout Delegate Advisory Council, but through all of her work and through her high school um, activities that she participates in. Lily is what Girl Scouting is all about, and she has decided that she wants to attend college and major in biology and pharmacy. So she's taking on what some of those careers of the future are going to be. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lily to the stage. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm honored to be with you all this morning. Girl Scouts has been a constant in my life since I joined when I was six years old. My family moved here from Chicago, and Girl Scouts was the first activity that my mom involved me in. Girl Scouts has stuck with me for so long because there's always something new to catch my attention. No matter what my interests are, there are Girl Scout programs that align with them. I've pursued so many passions because there are new badges, programming opportunities, and community service experiences that match what I want to do. I've learned so much in a decade of Girl Scouting, but one of the most important skills I've learned is leadership. For several years, I volunteered with our day camp programs. I've learned to be more organized as we provide multiple activities throughout the day. And I've learned the importance of keeping a level head while all of those activities are happening so that we can keep all of our girls safe. I have so much fun helping with that day camp every year. Caring for younger girls has been a powerful experience because I grew up attending those same camps too. I would look at the programming leaders and teen counselors and I could see that they had a really strong set of values and I hope that I'm setting the same kind of example for our girls today. But day camp isn't the only place I use those leadership skills. As Tammy mentioned, I'm one of two girls who sit on the board of directors and it's been so interesting taking in the conversations about the council's finances, seeing how meetings are run, and watching people take charge in, in a meeting without coming across as too forward. I've even learned what an audit was. <laughs> <laughs> I get to see leadership in action from every angle. And then I take what I learn and I apply it to the Girl Scout Delegate Advisory Council, which recently planned a conference for Girl Scouts in sixth through 12th grades called GirlCon. The conference was this past Saturday, and more than 50 girls attended different sessions related to health and future planning. The 10 other girls on the Delegate Advisory Council and I helped line up speakers, plan the food options, run the event, and so much more. It was very special watching younger girls enjoy an experience that I and the other members of the Delegate Advisory Council put our hearts into. I felt like a true leader in the community. Overall, everyone had a fun and educational experience. And as we planned the conference, I continued developing leadership skills that I'll carry into the future. I learned to create and stick to a timeline, solve problems as they came up, and communicate effectively with the other girls on my team. Through Girl Scouts, I have also found a passion for community service. Every year, my troop does uh, community service projects, and for several years, we've painted pumpkins around Halloween time for a local senior center, and have made blankets for the Ronald McDonald House. I volunteer weekly at the Friendship Circle, a group that provides weekly activities for people with developmental disabilities and special needs. The incredible experiences I've had with community service have impacted the career that I want to pursue. I've always been interested in science through community service, and I've seen the positive impact that medical professionals can have on people. Witnessing that was like an aha moment of realizing that I can help people and do something related to science. Girl Scouts has led me to trying many new opportunities, 
meeting new people, and developing skills that I would have never been able to develop on my own. Girl Scouts' impact on my life has been immeasurable. I'm so grateful that my mom signed me up all those years ago and that both of my parents are here supporting me today. I don't know who I would be otherwise. Thank you for letting me share my Girl Scout story. Now we're going to turn things over to you. With your table mates, you'll explore the issues facing girls today. Questions are provided for you on the table and your table facilitator will, mod <laughs> facilitator will moderate the 10 minute discussion. Enjoy the conversation. I love it, it works. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. It is so great to see all of you here today. I'm Amy Franco. I'm the chair and the president uh, of the board of Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland. Thank you for everyone who's been here, our CEOs from our sister councils, uh, Priscilla Tyson, uh, Lily and her parents. It's been just a fantastic morning. So I get the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Sophia Moore. Understanding rapid transformation of the global transformation of the global transportation industry and increasing the need for mobility solutions, Central Ohio Transit Authority named Sophia its first ever Chief Innovation Officer in September of 2019. As Chief Innovation Officer, Sophia works to integrate innovative ideas across all divisions at CODA. She also works with public and private partners to address current and anticipated transportation challenges, utilizing data and analytics to review and advance new business practices and opportunities at CODA. Sophia came to CODA from the private sector, working 17 years at NetJets. She joined NetJets in 2002 as a business analyst and ultimately became the company's first vice president of owner experience, design, and strategy. Under her direction, Sophia's team designed and developed strategies to improve the customer experience for NetJets clients. Sophia also served as a consultant for a technology services company and began her professional career as a human factors engineer for IBM. She is a Columbus native and a graduate of The Ohio State University, earning a master's degree in industrial and systems engineering. Please help us welcome Sophia. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here. It is such a great honor to be speaking at the State of the Girl and to talk about dreaming big. So I want all of you to take a moment and think of a place, in the, in the spirit of dreaming big, I want all of you to think about a place that is far away from here. A place so remote that foreigners cannot enter. A place where eight of the 10 tallest mountains in the world are located. But I also want you to think of a place that is going through a lot of political unrest, is a place that has a 5% literacy rate, a place where 1% of the population has access to electricity uh, and the telephone. This is Nepal in the 1950s. Nepal is a landlocked country that is located between India and China. And it was going through a lot of political unrest in the time. So it started to open itself up to foreigners. Most famously, you may have heard of Sir Edmund Hillary that conquered Mount Everest for the first time, the highest mountain in the world. However, also during this time, my dad was a 17-year-old um, male that had a very difficult decision to make. He was, his parents had taken him to school even though his three elder sisters did not go. And though he did, and, and he started to do very well, so he actually had the opportunity to go to medical school and be sponsored by the Nepalese government. He was one of the first four to be able to have the opportunity to leave the country and go to medical school. He continued to do well, and then he continued to get sponsorship by the Nepalese and British government to go to continue his medical studies in England. In 1973, he decided he wanted to get married, so he had an arranged marriage with my mother, and later that year, I was born in Birmingham, England. In 1974, my dad got additional opportunities to come to America. So they packed themselves up 
and made their way around the world to, and made their way to Ohio with a one-year-old in tow, and that was me. I know, I, have to, I do have to say I do love that jacket, and I, I wish I had it. I do wish that I had it, because I, I, I love it. This picture was actually taken at, uh, right outside Mont Carmel Hospital, uh, which is uh, down the street. So when you think about all of that stuff, about what my dad went through, you can imagine the pressure to succeed. My parents always told me that we were different, but not necessarily in a special way. In a way that people may look at us differently because of our culture and because of the color of our skin. To kind of put it into some perspective, at that time in the 1970s, when Nepalese people came to this country, they were so low in the number of people who entered, we were classified as other Asians. We were so low that it was considered unsubstantial to track. So as such, they really wanted to make sure that I assimilated and blended in. So much so, they never taught me their own language. Not because it was a rejection of their culture, but more so because they wanted me to uh, do well in America. So as such, those of you who know me, I was a painfully shy girl and always preferred to have my head in books and I was always doing puzzles and I was always reading because that's what my parents told me that would make me succeed in America. You know, as a child, it's really hard to understand when someone tells you that you're different. You don't understand what that means. One of the first recollections I have of that is when I was seven and I rode my bike to my friend's house. Uh, Natalie and her mother answered the door, and, but I couldn't go in. She said her dad had come home early and he didn't like people like me. I didn't really know what that meant, so I remember my, one of my first thought is like, whoa, your dad doesn't like first graders? <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, the look on her mom's face told me it was a lot more than that. So those are the types of things that made me really quiet and shy, and many times with friends, but also with family. At that time, because the Nepalese population was so low, Nepalese people would drive hours to see each other. So every once in a while, we would have, um, we would have people come and visit. I do have to say that outfit's also awesome. Um, <laughs> we would have people come and visit. So one time we had relatives here for a week. I didn't speak to them the entire week they were here. I totally knew it was the wrong thing to do, and my parents often told me, uh, you know, I need to talk to them. I just said I had nothing to say for an entire week. So as a child, you can probably sometimes get away with that kind of behavior. But as an adult, that can really restrict you by not talking. And as a woman, it can definitely harm you by not speaking. When you don't have a voice, you can't speak up for yourself. But you also can't speak up for others, and you can't make impact, and you can't make change. So one of the earliest things that I remember from my career was when I was in consulting, and uh, we had a big client appointment, and I got to go. I didn't do very well. Uh, I talked really quickly, and I was really nervous, and you know, I just didn't do a good job. And my manager, rightly so, pulled me aside and looked me straight in the eye and said, you know, people probably want to hear what you have to say. And that sounds so obvious in retrospect, but I realized that I needed to find my voice and all the studying that I had done to date was not going to make me successful. So I took a really radical approach and I decided to sign up for improv classes. So I can tell by the laughter, some of you know what improv is, uh, but basically, if you think of shows like Second City or Whose Line Is It Anyway, you get up on stage, you ask the audience for uh, suggestions, and then basically you have to make a scene right there, right now. Pretty much sounded like my absolute worst nightmare. <laughs> but the amazing thing about improv is it really teaches you how to have conversations. It teaches you how to go with the flow. And when everything comes together, it can actually be amazingly funny and deep and insightful. I loved it so much that uh, my classmates and I actually joined, uh, created our own female improv group, uh, the Shimmy Shake Project, 
And we performed for four years and had one or two shows a month. So even as an adult, I still consider myself kind of shy and quiet. So much so that I know some of the pe people in the audience here who know me will be surprised by some of the things that I have to say. Um, everything that I've mentioned from my dad's opportunity to leave Nepal to me being really reserved and quiet provides a million reasons why I shouldn't be standing here right now. However, if I hadn't gone through those experiences and I hadn't kind of worked them through, also provides me, a, also makes it like me being very unlikely to be here today. It's important to know that our past has a purpose and it drives who you are and where you are today. I believe many of the experiences I had today led me to engineering at Ohio State. That love of puzzles made me, made me want to solve problems. And as I grew older, I realized that I really loved solving really complex problems, and that especially if it was helping people. So recently, I took a role as the first chief innovation officer at CODA. Some of you may, you heard that today, you may have wondered why does CODA need a chief innovation officer? So I wanna talk a little bit about what's happening in Columbus and with CODA. Columbus is the 14th largest city in the United States. And to kind of put it in some perspective, we have added the city, the population of the city of Toledo since the year 2000. And in addition to that, we're going to be adding approximately 600,000 more people to Columbus in the next 20 years. As someone who's lived in Columbus most of her life, what makes Columbus a great place to live is that it's so easy to live here. It's so easy to live here because it's so easy to move here as compared to bigger cities. However, some of you who've been here for a while may have noticed that ah, it's not as easy as it used to be, and it takes a little bit longer to get from one place to another. And when you compare our, the, the growth of our city with cities such as Nashville and Austin that's actually had a higher growth rate, they are really constricted by their congestion because they didn't look at mobility in the region and they didn't make sure that they knew that their people could move. Right now, to kind of put it in some perspective, Columbus only moves two to six of their pop, two to six percent of the population through public transit. We also have one of the highest single occupancy vehicle rates in the United States in comparison to cities of our size. To put it in some comparison, Seattle currently moves about 35% of their population through public transit on a regular basis. So CODA's vision, which they changed last year, is to move every life forward. And I really love that statement because they're really talking about everyone. But I think what's more important is that it's about leaving no one behind. And it's actually, uh, I'll, I'll interject here, we had a great conversation about this at our table about access to Girl Scouts can also always be about mobility. So it really is talking about everybody. So this means that we're trying to move from a transit agency to a mobility company. We want to understand how we move people in Columbus. That means focusing on public and private partnerships. That means creating solutions through technology, uh, such as connected vehicles to help with traffic, and also new endeavors like the CODA on-demand service. We're examining new and innovative ways of solving mobility challenges Otherwise, it's really going to start to restrict our economic growth in Columbus. And that's not just for those who rely on transit. So when I reflect back on feeling different, it's really amazing how along the way I'm part of shaping the community that we all live in. However, driving it all from the beginning was my dad dreaming big. Now I'm in a position to dream big and better things for our community so that others can have opportunities and prosperity in a place that I call home. As I stand here today, it's an amazing experience to be in a, a position of empowerment and how women are succeeding in non-traditional female roles. I really hope one day that we can stop using the term non-traditional female roles when we talk about engineering and technology. However, the percentage of engineering at Ohio State has not changed since I was there 25 years ago. It still hovers around 25%. As you can see from this chart, uh, a lot of companies are still not fulfilling and having equality with women. And I think we all know with how the technology is adv advancing, a lot of the high paying jobs are there and we want our girls to have access to that. So with all the advancements, this has not changed. How can I help change that? There are two sides of this equation. Providing early exposure to girls to pique their interest in science and technology, 
but also to have males to support them and provide, them oppor uh, provide opportunities to females. As I have experienced, it's very intimidating to be in the science lab and to be the only female and no one talks to you and no one helps you out. It can be so challenging and to have a demanding career, but if you're in an organization that doesn't have an appropriate maternity leave policy for you and your female coworkers. It can be absolutely infuriating when you have the courage to speak up against your male manager who's made inappropriate comments, but when you speak up, I was taken off the project, not him. These are all experienced things I've experienced personally. But as just as my father has expectations for me, as a mother of two boys, I have expectations for my boys too. It is my responsibility to dream big for them so they can dream big for others. I believe the advancement of females, especially in currently male-dominated fields such as science and engineering, relies so much on how boys are taught about girls, especially in the earlier years. This means making chores that are equal and not based on gender roles. To ensure that they have a voice for themselves, but also to ensure that they have a voice for others too when something doesn't go right. That the achievement of girls are just as important as the achievement of boys. And I just want to mention a side note here. My first graders football team had one girl on the team and she was hands down the best player on the team. <laughs> and, that, and, anybody, and my husband was a coach and he would say that too. So my promise to you is that I understand that it takes both sides of the equation to help future girls succeed. We need to support them with opportunities, but it's also my role as a mother to ensure that my boys know that they're part of the equation too. I really wanna thank you so much for inviting me here today, and I don't need to invite you to dream big, that's why you came here today. I invite you to invite others to invite dream with you. Big, dream big with you, thank you. Wow, lots of lessons in that, huh? Say yes. <laughs> I especially like that it takes all of us to help lift our girls up so that they can dream big and achieve whatever they want to achieve in the future, regardless of where they've come from. Nepal, um, the inner cities, we talked about that, um, the suburban areas, um, that's what makes this so special and that's what makes this conversation so important. Thank you so much, Sophia, and thank you, Lily, both for um, sharing some comments today. Um, they were incredible. We'd also like to thank our sponsors who make today possible, uh, and that is AEP Foundation. There are gold sponsors. Our silver sponsors are J.P. Morgan Chase, Fifth Third, and Cardinal Health. And we also have some additional sponsors that are listed on the screen. Thank you. And I'm hopeful that you all had as incredible a conversation as we had at our table, and that was due to our um, table facilitators. So table facilitators, if you could stand and be recognized, we really appreciate you directing the conversation. These individuals are our community leaders who volunteered to come and lead the conversation, which is important that we need to keep uplifting, so thank you very much. And last, a special thank you to Columbus Metropolitan Club and Columbus TV for providing the audio visual equipment today. We thank you. And I didn't get to thank Priscilla Tyson earlier, Councilwoman Priscilla Tyson, for joining us and having great conversation. Um, and how you serve us in the nonprofit community and through girls. And she was a Girl Scout, is a Girl Scout alum. <laughs> Girl Scouts gives girls access to numerous leadership opportunities. And this is important because it's a huge um, component in their success, especially in the pillars that I, the program pillars that I previously announced, um, including STEM. And while Activities and access um, are very important to girls gaining skills. There's another piece that is equally as important, and that is confidence. For if girls do not have the confidence to gain the skills, they will not pursue the careers of the future that we need them to. And that's when we say we're dreaming big 
about giving girls access um, alongside of caring adults who are mentors that look like them, who are achieving at high rates so that they can see it to believe it. That's super important and that's what the secret sauce about Girl Scouts is all about. But unfortunately, not girl, all girls have equal access and that's something that we talked about at our table and you may have talked about at your table as well. And it's through the kindness of individuals and support of individuals who help us um, create a fund of financial assistance so that every girl who wants to be a Girl Scout can. So at your table, there is an envelope. And if you would be so kind and help support us in helping girls gain the um, skills that they need, the confidence they need through Girl Scouts, we would love for you to invest in a girl. Now you heard us talk a lot about Dream Big and that is our, the name of our local initiative. We named it Dream Big because it's as big as we can imagine. And you're gonna hear more about it. This is not a tease um, for later today, but you're gonna hear a lot about it coming out in the news um, as we pursue um, this transformational initiative. It's about getting more girls in the STEM um, workforce pipeline, in-demand jobs. You heard me say that Girl Scouts USA is um, putting 2.5 million girls in the STEM pipeline. Um, we are going to do our part in helping to do that, in serving in, um, girls and creating programs in kindergarten through 12th here locally. And that's what the Dream Big initiative's all about. And what we wanna do is we wanna take that programming across the 30 counties that we serve so that all girls have access to these firsthand experiences in STEM and the outdoors. Why is this so important? And you hear STEM talked about a lot. Um, that's because the rate of um, the STEM profession is growing faster than any other profession in the country. And in order to be in the competitive global marketplace in the next decade, um, we're gonna be adding a million new jobs in that field. And cybersecurity, engineering, many of the things that um, Sophia talked about. The issue, uh, the challenge is that while we have about 48% of women in the workforce, only 28% are in STEM jobs. And that's all STEM jobs. When we start talking about leadership in STEM, the number goes down dramatically. And in some fields, it's as low as 3%. So what we wanna do is work with companies within our community so that we can create programming that shows girls what some of those opportunities are, whether that's a four-year degree, whether that's a two-year degree, whether that's a tech, a tech certification, so that they can get into the jobs that we need in our community. And with, what did you say, 600,000 more individuals coming into our community, there's gonna be a lot of jobs. We want our girls to be up front in those interviews um, getting those jobs. And I went off script, so this is a little interesting. Um, so. <laughs> Here's how, here is how we are dreaming big. It's a little video to show a little snippet. I, I promised a teaser, um, a little snippet of what we're looking to do and understand more to come in the near future.
we hope that you're going to continue on this journey as we dream big on behalf of our girls so that they have the tools needed to be our leaders of tomorrow. Together, we can change our local workforce pipeline of the future and unleash the power in every girl in our community. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. I know, again, if they were anything like ours, it um, was uplifting, and it shows that we have a lot of work to do. But we can do that together on behalf of our girls. On your way out, don't forget, if you want that tasty treat to support the girls in that largest social entrepreneurial program, there are girls waiting to uh, work on their people skills and their money management skills with you, so please um, feel free to stop by the booth. And thank you for joining us today and supporting our girls um, from around our jurisdiction. Have a great day.